Good afternoon. We began the series with the light of sunset bathing the Catskill Mountains and Catskill Creek in an idyllic picture by Thomas Cole, the first great American landscape painter, and the inspiration for several generations of artists who would portray the new nation as a place both wild and cultivated. There was a lot of artifice involved in this. Here we actually seem to float above the river, and we look back at a scene which has a distinctly Arcadian flavor. Cole's pupil, Frederick Church, took up the mission of exploring America, north and south, sometimes painting what was not there. In this case, deep in the thick Maine woods, inserting a road, a settlement, a cattle, a mill, attributes of civilization the church hoped might come to what was still a vast wilderness. In the picture we'll be exploring today by Sanford Gifford, it's just after sunset in the Catskill Mountains. The painting is about four and a half feet wide, um, and I'm going to show it to you now without comment for just a few minutes. The sun has just set, and all the light on the land is reflected down from the sky. The yellow band, and especially the salmon pink clouds. It's turned the valley, uh, which is called Cottersgill Clove, to a strange red-brown. In the foreground, uh, light on the mountain uh, on the left and the right is almost distinguished. Closer to us, we can make out rocks and barren trees. The stream at the bottom reflects the sky upside down, and then the water slips over the edge. We see all that, but we might miss this creature, a small bear making his way down to the water. On the other side, there's enough light to reveal a deep cleft, kind of canyon, off of the main valley. There are touches of light here and there on the trunk uh, of a fallen tree, and on the rock, the fractured plane here of a flat rock, little flares of light that will be, be extinguished in just minutes. At the edge, on the right, you can make out a tiny stream and a miniature waterfall in motion, like the bear. Nothing else moves. On both sides are bare trees standing dead, probably killed by some fast-moving fire that took the foliage but didn't burn them up. When you step back, all these details take their place in a broad panorama, twice as wide as it is high. 
There's no human presence or sign of it. There's nobody here except you. The artist has made it seem as though you are standing where the artist was, on the brink of the stream, just a few steps from the edge. The painter makes it easy to understand how this place was shaped. It's a valley cut over vast geological time by the river in the distance. The river is and was supplied by streams like the one right at our feet, which is in turn fed by that little rivulet on the right. So the painter is making us notice the Earth's forces at work, not just their product, this valley that looks so still. You can imagine what you might hear in this place, but can't see. The distant drumming from below of water that has slid silently over the lip and pounds the rocks below day and night without stopping until it freezes solid. So the picture shows a moment in a day, one of ceaseless days and years. Now, if you remember this picture from a couple of years ago, you'll be pleased when you look again upstairs. Um, thanks to a sensitive treatment by Ian McClure, uh, it's more legible now and just as subtle. In a little while, I'm going to examine this picture, see what's behind it, to see how the artist went about conceiving and painting it. Uh, but first, uh, here's something about Sanford Gifford and his earlier career. Sanford Robinson Gifford was 38 when he painted this picture, Twilight in the Catskills. He did that in his studio on 10th Street, New York, a building whose tenants included Frederick Church and Albert Bierstadt, and a convenient group, a congenial group of lead, leading artists. Gil, Gifford was two years older than Church, and he had a somewhat slower start. He grew up in Hudson, New York, across the Hudson River uh, from Thomas Cole, and although he didn't study with Cole, he learned a lot from Cole's pictures of the Catskills, their subjects and techniques, and the fact that it was possible to learn a living painting them. Uh, Frederick Church showed several spectacular paintings in 1855 that made him the leading American landscape painter. And he was a strong influence on Gifford and a role model, as you're going to see. Gifford had gone to Brown, but he only lasted a couple of semesters before he was in New York at the age of 19. All of our worst fears. Uh, at the age of 19, studying, <laughs> studying with a private teacher. And then at the National Academy of Design where he began exhibiting in 1847, along with Church and others. The first painting we've got by Gifford is this oil sketch of the celebrated Cotterskill Falls, which is a subject that Thomas Cole painted repeatedly. Gifford's version is competent, but I have to say earthbound uh, compared to Cole's kind of hyperactive, colorful forms. There were more small paintings of unremarkable subjects in the Catskills, like these, and one of an Adirondack scene, uh, one of a pair of large oval pictures that got Gifford admitted to the National Academy in 1854. It's kind of a strange performance uh, with an ambitious sunrise in a mountain composition in the manner of Cole, but stiff and unconvincing. But recently, a little painting is, by Gifford has come to light that is something else again. It must date from these early years uh, of Gifford's work, and it shows where this artist was headed. The fiery sunset over a lake is startling, and of course you can't imagine it without the example of Church. Um, like Church, Gifford made wonderful lively oil sketches that are full of impulsive energy, and I think it's clear that the example of Church's Catskill paintings never left him. I imagine that Gifford knew and remembered this astonishing painting by Church of the mists rising in patches on the rim of North Mountain. And I think he recalled it when he made this oil sketch years later, just at the time he returned to the Catskills to make studies that resulted in the Yale Twilight painting and others. But in between, Gifford traveled to England 
1855. Gifford was a reader of John Ruskin's influential book, Modern Painters. And you'd expect him to go, like, to go like a shot to see paintings by Turner, whom Ruskin was rapturous about, and he did, but he was disappointed in Turner, just as Cole had been, about what he described as the carelessness of Turner's painting methods. He was able to talk over uh, with Ruskin these matters, who uh, defended the ar artist's imagination, and all artists' imagination. It wasn't, in other words, the literal truth of a scene that mattered so much as the impression it had made on the painter's mind. Of course, that judgment uh, in favor of the painter's impression, in favor of nature, in other words, seen through the artist's temperament, that was becoming the core belief of French avant-garde painters at just the same time. Gifford went to Paris for the annual Salon uh, and wrote home that the French painters favored simple subjects. They sacrificed everything to the unity of a picture, and they had a poetic feeling for the beauty of common things. A lot of this Gifford took to heart. He went on hikes uh, to the English countryside, uh, here the Lake District. He lived cheaply like a student, often by himself, and he sketched, keeping that up in Germany and Switzerland and Italy, where he took a hiking trip with his friend Albert Bierstadt. As a result uh, of the trip on the continent, um, he came home with more sketches and a few larger paintings. One of these was a great big view of Lake Nemi, a site about 20 miles from Rome, uh, that he painted in Rome and brought home uh, to show at the National Academy in New York in 1858. In designing it, uh, Gifford took a shortcut um, and used a composition by Turner as a starting point, uh, something a New York critics spotted and carped about. <laughs> but actually, Gifford changed just about everything, as you can see. Um, it was the first appearance uh, of what became a trademark of Gifford's, this painting, the sun shown head on in the center, touching everything, tinting the air, almost making you squint a little, and becoming the event and the generating force of the picture. Frederick Church had painted the first of these solar sh showpieces, you could call them, a few years earlier with this stunning view in Ecuador. The educated part of the audience knew uh, who had set the example for Church here, and that was, of course, Turner. And they knew where Turner had gotten his inspiration from the old masters from Claude Lorrain some two centuries earlier. The Americans, Church and Gifford, were taking up a challenge to demonstrate that their powers could rival those of the great painters of the old world. Back home, Gifford returned to New England and Catskill scenery. He traveled to Vermont and climbed and then painted the highest of the Green Mountains, Mount Mansfield. His sketches capture the hazy afternoon air irradiated by the declining sun which hits the sharp edges of the rocks, making bright highlights. It's all techniques that he brought with him to the Catskills, as you saw. The people you see are probably hikers from New York and Boston, nicely togged out, uh, up to watch the sunset. In the following year, by the way, a hotel was built right on the saddle between these two summits, a hotel. Um, free enterprise at work, again. Uh, as it does in the American wilderness at this period, uh, the Catskills, New Hampshire, and now Vermont. And there was a toll road built up from the valley uh, at the right. The toll road is still there, as some of you skiers know. It's a novice ski trail called the Toll Road. Gifford's Mount Mansfield was pretty faithful to the actual mountain. This mountain is a fantasy a great slab tilting up from the broad plain with something like the abruptness of Frederick Church's Katahdin. But this isn't Katahdin or any other American peak. It's an idealized bit of topography that to me suggests another important mountain in American painting, the one that appears 
in the background of each of Cole's five, five uh, paintings of the course of empire. This one is a fantasy of the Arcadian or pastoral state of humankind. In any case, Gifford called his picture The Wilderness and included in the lower left a few natives camped on the shore. Indigenous people had been pretty much case, chased out of the places in the Northeast that Gifford knew. So these people are part of a historical as well as geographical fantasy. This is benevolent nature. This is an unspoiled American wilderness. But there is an interesting wrinkle here. The light and atmosphere that Gifford creates for wild America belongs to a European pictorial language centuries old that was used to depict pastoral life in antiquity, as in Claude Lorrain, and also in contemporary times in the Dutch painter Albert Kuyp's lemon yellow sunshine that expresses the favor of God and nature to these herdsmen somewhere in a fantasized river landscape. Gifford was in competition with his friend Church, not for show-stopping scenery so much, but above all for subtle poetic light and atmosphere. This is a big picture, the same size uh, as the twilight in the wilderness. Uh, twilight uh, in the, in the, uh, in the Elliot Gallery. But uh, three years earlier, uh, Church had shown his sensational Niagara, which was twice as big as this, and a tremendous novelty in subject and vantage point. And in the special effects category, uh, Church had been on top uh, without a rival for 10 years, I hear, Niagara Falls, with a series of dazzling pictures that seem to explore the outer limits of the credible in nature, especially where sunsets are concerned. Gifford made some experiments with the setting sun in small oil sketches like this one uh, with a tranquil lake, a blanket of pink clouds, here it is, blazing yellow sun, and Indian spectators. He must have been moved by Church's most extravagant and successful exercise in this vein, the twilight in the wilderness. Uh, here there is no sign of humans. There's not a stump, not a cabin. The lake and its wooded slopes are uninhabited. The sun has just set. It's like light rakes over the hills, and at the same time turns the undersides of the clouds an astonishing salmon pink and makes their rippling surface look like silk taffeta. It's the most extreme combination yet of sheer gorgeousness with exact description. The location can't be identified with any particular place where a church had been. It's an invention, and critics praised it lavishly. The following year after the war began, Gifford volunteered in the 7th Regiment, a New York militia. Uh, a New York uh, militia, not uh, in combat, but on guard duty in Washington and Baltimore. That left him free for half of each year, starting in the late summers, when he returned home to Hudson and the Catskills and work as a painter. In the summer of 1861, he made this view near his parents' home in Hudson on the East Bank, opposite the Catskills, looking south towards a very small mountain, Mount Marino, on the other side of a shallow bay. As the sun declines and almost melts the Catskills in the distance, the place becomes a sort of tranquil Arcadia on Hudson. Another artist, uh, Henry Arry, uh, had painted this same view eight years earlier uh, from a bit farther back, and he shows you some details that Gifford had eliminated. At the right side, the smokestacks of the Hudson Iron Works, which belonged to Gifford's father. <laughs> and in the center, uh, cutting across the bay, you can see a railroad line. Neither fitted the idyllic image that Gifford wanted, so he edited them out. Gifford was a hiker, and most of the pictures he made that summer show views from high places, often from spots made famous by Thomas Cole, 30-odd years earlier, 
and now frequented by outdoorsy people like Gifford. He sketched this from a spot uh, well above the other hikers who are resting on the rocks and watching the late afternoon sun go down. Everything is backlighted, and the clove has the gray haze of a warm, moist summer day. Here's another oil sketch of another viewpoint on the same face of South Mountain, this time looking east as the sun rises. Gifford stations himself at a distance. He's made the climb too, and he wants to include his companions, one waving, the other still climbing. Again, there's a melting haze in the air. The most original and successful picture from this summer of sketching is this one. Very big, very dark, very barren, and conveying a mood that's new in Gifford's work. It made a tremendous impression when it was first shown in New York and Boston. After it went on view in March 1861 at the National Academy, a writer for Harper said it was the largest and most important landscape in the exhibition. It was the great picture of the season, the crowning glory of this exhibition. It came as a surprise to people who'd been following Gifford's work. One of them wrote, it had a bold effect and was a happy departure from the artist's conventional sunsets. His imagination, said this writer, seems more profound and his sentiment more enlarged. The painting moved some critics to unusually vivid writing. One of them said, Mr. Gifford has imbued the very atmosphere with a sense of coming darkness. How cunningly he's taught light to counterfeit gloom. The reporter for the New York Daily Tribune wrote this, while in the foreground the jutting points of rock and hillock catch a touch of flame from the reflection in the western light, the intervening valleys are sinking into the deep shadow of the coming darkness, though lit up nevertheless to a sort of darkness visible by an atmosphere so full of warmth and brilliancy. This writer was quoting Milton in Paradise Lost, no less, the famous passage where the poet describes what Satan and the other rebel angels saw when they first arrived in hell. The dismal situation, waste and wild, a dungeon horrible on all sides round, as one great furnace flamed, yet from those flames no light, but rather darkness visible, served only to discover sights of woe, regions of sorrow, doleful shades, where peace and rest can never dwell. Well, as to the mood of the picture, uh, and what that might have conveyed, we're going to come back. But first I want to ask our persistent question in these lectures. How much does this scene resemble a place that Gifford might actually have seen? How realistic is it, in other words? Well, that question and many others were answered by Adam Greenhall, who is a Yale graduate student who is now a curator at the National Gallery. He wrote the first study of the paintings since it reappeared in 1998. It actually had been famous in its day, but it had dropped out completely from sight ever since 1881 after Gifford died, and so it doesn't figure in the various books and catalogs of Gifford's work until very recently. Well, Greenhall did an excellent, thorough job of getting the visual and documentary evidence together, and a lot of what I have to say is based on that. There is a drawing of 1860 in the Fogg Museum that is the starting point. It's hard to make out, so I boosted the contrast a bit. It represents Cottersgill Clove and Cottersgill Creek rising diagonally from the lower right. The Clove passes a side canyon, which you could just make out if you look hard, uh, where Cottersgill Falls is, and it rises up to the plateau of Haynes Falls up here. At the top, Gifford has outlined the profile of three mountains. Just see it. Sugarloaf at the left, Hunter Mountain in the middle, and the low double peaks of Ontiora Mountain. Greenall suggested that Gilford, Gifford made this drawing from a point high on the south wall of Cat Cottersgill Creek, at or near a, route, a rock uh, outcrop uh, called Poet's Ledge. 
I wanted to check this for myself. The topo map shows the clove uh, as a deepening valley, a cleft running east, left to right, towards the Hudson Valley. The black line is the paved road, and which wasn't there in Gifford's time. My red arrow shows the suggested viewpoint uh, that Gifford took up, and the point it points in the direction of his view, west. Up there on one of the ledges, sure enough, uh, there's a spot that gives the view that Gifford drew and painted. Another shot taken closer to the edge makes things, I think, a little clearer. Way over on the right of the ledges here, where Gifford painted those two oil sketches you saw a moment ago, we're seeing a view from the opposite side, a view that no artist before Gifford had ever painted, a comprehensive view of Cottersgill Clove, the famous clove, including um, here, the side canyon with the famous Cottersgill Clove, where the blue arrow is at the top. In his painting, Gifford made some changes. He made the distant mountains uh, more prominent, bigger, clearer in silhouette. He made the clove itself a lot broader with steeper sides, and he gave the creek a kind of floodplain. And he gave his painting a foreground ledge here, a vantage point with the top of a waterfall. So isn't this the ledge where he studied the distant view? No, it's not. I'm sure that Greenall was right in his cautious suggestion that this is actually the top of the best known waterfall in the Catskills, Cottersgill Falls. In his studio, Gifford grafted that falls onto his distant view taken from a distant place. It's a distant view you could never have had from the falls. Let me demonstrate. Um, the falls of the Catterskill here on the left by Cole, the double cascade, seen from a vantage point that's plausible but involves some manipulation on his part. And here on the right two summers ago, uh, the falls itself. And here Gifford again, as seen from a higher vantage point off to the side. The top of the falls uh, here is eroded slabs of limestone, gentle, like pavers, and has two big guardian boulders, one at the left with a pointed projection. It's not like the top of any of the other three or four waterfalls in the clove, but it is like what Gifford painted, with tranquil water pooled up as though in a garden. The long drop that it makes is just out of sight. And there are the boulders on both sides. I should say that there are a lot of paintings of Cottersgill Falls by many artists, but only in Giffords does an artist take the spectator close to the brink, high above the unseen rocks below, and denies her the view of what everybody came to see there, which was the spectacle of water plunging, floating down 130 feet in feathery plumes dashing on the rocks continually without end, seemingly without beginning. That element of time uh, is here in the painting, as I began to say before. The water that trickles down uh, on the right, um, the water that falls off at the center and reappears, snakes away in the distance. Gifford reminds us of the geological process that formed the clove. Geological knowledge was spreading in the 1860s. We've seen it enacted in Frederick Church's pictures of Ecuador. And in the next lecture, we'll see how Bierstadt emphasizes it in his pictures of Yosemite Valley. So Church's painting is a wide angle, composite view that you could never have had in real life. For Gifford, as well as for Cole and Church, this was better than real life, more dramatic, more suggestive of the power of nature than either the view from the distant ledge or from the top of the falls could ever be. Cole had argued strenuously for an artist's freedom to create what he called compositions, pictures that used nature rather than copying it. For these artists, painting wasn't an exercise in topography. It was an effort that combined observation and imagination. 
Gifford's title was not Cotter's Gill Clove, after all, it was more general. It was Twilight in the Catskills. But when he returned a year later to the sketches that he'd made of the clove, particularly the two that you saw earlier, he made a large painting. Also looking up the valley, it's his best known picture. It's nearly as big as the Yale Twilight, but it's utterly different. Vertical, like the sketches, and full of the radiant sunlight and delicately tinted air of late summer. It's true to the general shape of the clove, but it has a lot of small alterations in the walls and a few additions to give it more interest, uh, yeah, such as uh, the good-sized pond at the bottom of Haynes Falls on the left and over at the right, a settler's cabin uh, in the clearing, neither of which was ever actually there. They're like the Native Americans who appear in other Catskill paintings by Cole and Gifford. They set the calendar back a century or more. When I worked at the Met, I used to sit in front of this picture for hours. I liked that better than, better than going out of doors. <laughs> I especially appreciated the fact that there were no people in it. And, it, and, it, and it, it wasn't until the Gifford show in 2004 at the Met and Fort Worth in the National Gallery that I noticed uh, something I hadn't seen before. Yes, uh, a climber on the rocks. Actually, the hat is what you see first. And then the dog who's watching him struggle. During 1861 and 62, the years that he painted the Met and Yale pictures, there were other events to occupy Gifford's mind and his time. Uh, in the spring of summer of 1861, 10 states seceded from the Union. Gifford enlisted in the 7th Regiment of the New York National Guard and went on active duty in Washington for several months. He never saw action, but for two more years he continued doing a few months guard duty in Washington and Baltimore. The schedule gave him plenty of time to travel and paint. Some of the pictures he painted are a record of the utter boredom of life in camp, and occasionally poetic moments like this sentry at twilight at the top. The panorama on the right of his regiment uh, in Campton, Maryland, spells out what soldiers do in camp. Moving from left to right, they write letters home, eat standing up, rest, talk, talk some more, clean your weapons, hang up your washing, and you wait. Here, Gifford painted a very beautiful sky with sun breaking through the clouds. Question, did Gifford intend a topical message with this parting of the clouds? Did it, as one writer says, signify the aftermath of Gettysburg? The camp was 35 miles from Gettysburg, and so uh, Gifford and Gifford painted the picture in the following year. So was he really showing the, what I'm quoting now, spreading of the sun's providential light over the landscape and its union occupants? I wonder. I bring this up because the twilight in the Catskills has been interpreted in this way. It's been seen as profoundly gloomy, uh, a reflection of what's claimed as the mood of the nation in 1860 and 61, when war looked more and more inevitable. In these lectures, I've been pretty much, where interpretation is concerned, pretty much sticking to the middle of the road. Um, I'm a non-specialist after all, but I want to make a short off-road <laughs> detour and examine uh, that claim for a moment. It's become common for writers on American landscape paintings for the years just before and after the Civil War to see them as intentionally allegorical. Eleanor Jones Harvey sets the tone. She says, in paintings of an era when life was governed by the terrain and the weather, skies and geography told a version of the story, bringing together literary metaphor and visual imagery to create a war-inflected layer of meaning. In her exhibition on the Civil War in American Art at the Smithsonian five years ago, 
that she went far beyond documented history and deep uh, into war-inflected layers of meaning. She brought well-known landscapes into it, like this one, Heed's Approaching Thunderstorm of 1859. Storms had been a staple image for war in American sermon, sermons and editorials. She quotes a contemporary reviewer who mentions Heed's ominous hush and Heed's dread feeling of the coming storm. Heed's seated figure, she says, watching as the dramatic events unfold around him seems emblematic of the majority of the North who viewed abolitionists as troublemakers and preferred to wait rather than take action. About the Twilight in the Wilderness by Church, she follows, uh, by um, Church here, that she follows the uh, Franklin Kelly in saying that it struck viewers as a last brilliant moment before darkness overshadowed the landscape. Viewers remarked on, and a quote, the play between hope and melancholy. Uh, Harvey drew it into the politics of the day and called the picture a visual fulcrum for the tensions that dominated current events. Gifford's Catskill Twilight, she says, did not speak to the glories of God in the wilderness, nor did it rejoice in the spiritual regeneration that these artists typically felt in their beloved Catskills. Instead, uh, she says, instead Gifford vested in his twilight a sense of destruction and loss, underscored by the stand of trees flaming the, flaming the view. These are not simply dead, but victims of fire. Their scarred remains speak of violence to the landscape, unusual in American art. She calls the trees harbingers of the destruction to come. The painting is, she says, an elegy for the passing of an era, the passage from peace to war, from unencumbered appreciation of the mountains Gifford loved to a growing sense of melancholy that the new Eden was on the brink of destruction without the promise of renewal. She goes on to say that the gorge in the mountains in the Metropolitan was an expression of relief and joy by Gifford at his release from the first two years of service in the war. She calls the light in the picture transcendent, the flame of spiritual pur pur purity burning away the memories of war. The trouble with these claims is that nobody produces a contemporary artist or critic or commentator or even preacher saying that any landscape of this period was a metaphor for war, fear of war, preparation for war, relief or jubilation at the end of war. Of course, landscape painters were working to stir all sorts of emotions in their viewers, but emotions aroused by current events, we might ask, we might ask, can a work of art function as, quote, the emotional barometer of the mood of the nation? That sounds like a similar but traditional notion in American studies, the American mind. Alan Wallach and others have dismissed that concept because it assumes that there's a class of American intelligentsia that's homogeneous enough to constitute anything like a single mind or have a single mood. There isn't one now, and I doubt there was one in 1860. But let's look at the painting again for other ways to get at Gifford's intentions. We've already seen it as a reminder of how uh, the scene was formed in geologic time. Let's ask, how were the trees burnt? Well, the trunks aren't actually charred, but fast-moving fires in dry undergrowth do burn leaves and needles and some branches of trees that are left standing then like this, dead. Catskill forests have undergone more than 100 years of logging and wildfire. Thomas Cole had lamented the losses already in the 1840s. By Gifford's time, the big villains were gone, not only most loggers of profitable timber for sawmills, but also the hemlock cutters and bark strippers. Useless, bar burnt, uh, partly burnt trees like this were left behind. And so were whole forests of stumps. One of the most moving pictures Gifford ever painted was this one of Hunter Mountain, 
in radiant twilight with a settler's house in the background and a miserable trickle of a stream coming through a pasture that's full of stumps. Even so, this is a less dire situation than the one he first painted in a sketch. It shows the same pasture, but crowded with boulders and even more stumps. And this is just a homestead. <clears throat> the real culprits, as some of you saw in the first lecture on coal, were the tanners, the owners of small factories like this one in a sketch by Gifford at the bottom. This is where hemlock bark was boiled with animal hides to produce leather, which got shipped off to New York and Albany. Tanneries were built next to creeks so that smelly acid effluent went into the creeks. And this one had been out of business for a couple of decades because the once abundant supply of Catskill hemlock trees had finally been exhausted. The stumps stayed behind. If we're meant to feel a mood of foreboding in Gifford's painting, I think it may well reflect a situation that he saw around him, a threat to the land by exploiters, not to the Union, rebels, not to the Union from rebel states. There was severe de deforestation in the Catskills 150 years ago, something that you can suspect by looking at a relatively recent photograph at the top where the place that inspired this picture has grown up in dense green right down to the banks of the creek. I want to move on to a group of pictures that Gifford, Gifford painted in the last 15 years of his life. Some are about dramatic weather. We'll come back uh, to this one. But here's something else, a winter scene, not a common subject by anybody at this period, <clears throat> again at twilight, with these sort of Rothko-like bands of color in the sky, the trees exquisitely feathery, feathery and this uh, kind of sliver of moon that's reflected in the ice and split by a little snowbank. It's a very broad composition that's hardly bracketed at the edges at all, and it seems like it could continue indefinitely in both directions. For two summers, Gifford went the way of Cole and his friend Church to Maine. Um, here, uh, near the summit of Cadillac Mountain, he made a breathtaking view out past Seal Cove to the Atlantic. It's not just the place being recorded here, but the specific conditions of atmosphere, too. Afternoon light in moist air that bleaches the colors and values. And Gifford has made a picture of a picture being made. The artist on the ledge must be Gifford himself, tall, bearded, with a very Gifford-like sketch uh, in his paint box. Gifford moved up and down the Hudson in the 1860s, and in this case, down to Nyack uh, on the West Bank, just north of the Tappan Zee Bridge, in this small picture here at Yale, which he based on meticulous drawings. It's delicate in every way, especially in the way that he takes the color from robust autumn reds uh, up close uh, to greens uh, in the middle to a familiar range of blues and grays in the far distance. Another exercise in classic atmospheric perspective with no interference or complication by changing weather. It's actually a good moment to introduce another uh, painter Gifford has an affinity with, uh, John Kensett at the bottom. He was about the same age and had about a similar background, had a European stint, and was part of that circle of New York painters that included Church and Gifford and others. He had something like Gifford's sensibility, with a preference for simple compositions of scenery on the eastern seaboard and a feel for the delicacies of light executed in meticulous brushwork. Kensett uh, created a type of composition that collectors were crazy for. Uh, they, um, small pictures, I mean, of beaches and other pleasant places they knew from their summer holidays in Newport or the Boston North Shore or here, the coast of New Jersey. Skies are almost always radiant and the views out to sea are uninterrupted. Mm -hmm. 
Gifford's subjects uh, can be majestic. This is a subject, uh, picture of purporting to be a view in the Adirondacks that Gifford, when he wrote to the owner, described better than I can. The scene, he says, though not intended to be exact as a portrait, is founded on a view of the Adir and the Adirondack Mountains. The time is about three o'clock in the afternoon of a summer day. Over the large mountain, which fills the middle of the picture, there is a passing, a thin, illuminated veil of rain, which gradually thickens to the extreme right with a dense shower. From an opening over the mountain, the sunlight bursts from behind a cloud and passes over the whole central portion of the picture, illuminating the rain veil, the rugged flanks of the mountain, the foothills, and the valley below. Gifford intended the picture to be admired from a distance and to be inspected up close. And there you see a lot of tiny details that make it clear that this is no wilderness. In the middle ground, uh, you see a horizontal line all the way across, the edge of an embankment maybe, or a road up close. That is what it is. There's a house, and the trees are already changing color, and there's smoke in the chimney. There are small buildings on the slopes high above. Further over, more buildings on the road and above. Farther still, a farm in the valley with a fenced enclosure. All of this, you know, <clears throat> all of this is no wilderness, but a settled country. Is it the Adirondacks, you might possibly ask, if you're someone like me? Um, there is a general resemblance to the mountains of south of Elizabethtown, where Gifford made some drawings, but there's no group of sharply pointed peaks there or anywhere, and no lake or river that looks like this. As Gifford suggested, it's a fantasy on Adirondack themes. So Gifford was not simply a poet of still, radiant images. Um, here uh, is that example of his flair for the dramatic. A rainstorm sweeps over a mountain lake that looks like Lake George in autumn foliage. There are boiling dark clouds, sheets of rain advancing, and lurid light from the tops of the cumulus clouds that glint off the boulders in a way that it, they do uh, in the Yale twilight. We're meant to be seeing this from the opposite bank, or maybe from a boat. The only humans beside us are some natives uh, camped beneath the huge boulder which has calved a small version of itself, again, an acknowledgment of geologic processes, which, like the Indians here, helps to um, put the scene into some era before recorded time. In painting a beach scene in the fashionable resort of Long Branch, New Jersey, Gifford was mining a vein that Kensett had discovered and found profitable. We get a breathtaking rush of perspective, waves, dunes, lines of stranded kelp in the sand, all converge and take our eye way down the beach to where it melts to haze on the horizon, past the uh, jaunty little beach houses uh, huddled in the dunes and these loungers under sailcloth. Long Branch was getting popular in the years after the Civil War we get quite a different view of the place from Winslow Homer a year or two later. Homer had returned from a year in Paris, having seen paintings of subjects like this by Eugène Boudin and Claude Monet. And so at Long Branch, he, Homer responded to the more chic, the more to, I think, the chic uh, customers than to the beach itself. <laughs> Gifford traveled and uh, sketched very widely in the 1870s the way Church and Bierstadt did. He went to the Middle East, uh, to the Rocky Mountains, and even to the Pacific Northwest up until his death in 1880. Gifford's talent continued to be for serenity, expressed by simple, stable compositions and finely tuned effects of light. Here the great volcano of Rainier, Mount Rainier, um, later named Rainier, originally Tacoma. 
the volcano raises uh, up itself up like a, an apparition <clears throat> above Commencement Bay, the ancestral home to the Poyala people, who had actually mostly been forced onto a reservation 20 years earlier. Some of them paddle in their enormous dugout canoes as though they were still trading with other tribes and white people. Gifford included these natives to turn back the clock, I think to gratify his nostalgia, and to produce in his viewers some mix of admiration and possibly regret. One last sunset. Here the breezes quit, as it often does at the end of the day, and becalmed all the sailing vessels, mostly yachts, small and large, that normally crisscross New York Harbor. It's only the steam-powered ferries, like that one at the left, only the steam-powered ferries and the tugs can get around, and they do. Gifford composes a scene to create a broad lane of open water that leads all the way back to the west shore and reflects the golden light. It seems amazing that it was only a dozen years later that Gifford painted this strange sundown. We can't know just why this master of luminosity chose to produce a view that's so distinctly somber and on an audacious scale. I doubt that it was intended as an allegory. It may not even have been his emotional response to the coming of war. I think it may instead have been a kind of lament for time passing and for the changing face of the earth, degraded by its exploiters. It was, in any case, the first great triumph of a painter of deep conscience, great feeling, and skill. In the next lecture, we're going to look at the last of these sunsets. Um, Thoreau said, westward is heaven. That idea appealed to Albert Bierstadt, and the next time we'll look at how he acted on it. Thank you. <laughs>